Well, welcome to the Pillars of Leadership podcast. Today we have Robert Hunt. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Robert. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> You're in the Dallas area, so it's right uh, morning for you. Yeah, yep. I've had a busy morning already. It's a full day. Every, every day is a full day. I'm enjoying my life. Yeah, Robert is, and, and we'll talk more about his book, but I don't know how you do it all. I was looking through your your bio and your your background a little bit. Cal State uh, University alum. Your background was VP in marketing sales and business development. Today, we're going to talk about um, accountability, um, things that CEOs struggle with and challenges and other leaders as well. And what are the things they can do? What are the top things they can do to uh, provide solutions, to help others, to help their business, et cetera? So I've got your list in front of me, but um, just a little bit more about your background and, and you can add on here. Married 25 years, you're an esports investor. I want to know more about that, but not today. Uh, oh, yeah. You are the top 1% ranked podcast guest. So you always have something to say. I was on um, in a session with you last week for with the Accomplished Executives Group, and you presented there. And you're known as the accountability guy. And I'm interested to hear about that. That might go along with your, you lead CEO peer groups in Dallas, Texas, and you're an executive coach there. And I will be doing something similar in Virginia Beach. So I'm very interested. Awesome. To about that. Tell us a little bit more. Did I miss anything? Well, uh, let's see. I have uh, my beautiful wife, Kathy, and I've been married 25 years and she is truly my best friend and life is good because I get to share with her. <clears throat> I have two adult children. Uh, Lauren lives in Austin with Dylan, her husband, and James is still home with us here in the DFW area for another year while he finishes up college at UT Dallas. Um, I grew up in Southern California, but I moved to Texas in 2010. I love living in Texas. It mm -hmm. is the best country in America. <laughs> and I, I'm very proud of being here. Um, it fits me well. It's it's a state where everybody wants to be here and uh, wants to help each other be their best. And so I really feel that. So thank, that, that introduction was great. I, I great. feel like I should get to know me. No, oh, it's <laughs> it's going to be a good time. I'm looking forward to it. And um, we'll talk about the book a little later but you can see the uh the unabashedly unashamed t-shirt there it's called nobody cares it talks about mountains and hiking and climbing and uh accountability and so we'll talk about that a little later um what i wanted to kick off with is the the challenges that ceos face in preparing mm -hmm. for this a lot of ceos are optimistic 73 percent of them are optimistic about uh, their organizational performance. And that's a little higher than if you look at the entirety of our society going into an election year, right? Um, but the top CEO concerns, retention, attracting talent, training, and then we talked about it, geopolitical issues, inflation, advanced technology and AI, and then the ramifications of the elections. Um, Where's the part where they're optimistic? The optimist that's gone. So that was that was old data. That was, that was 1998. <laughs> Isn't it amazing though that you can be that optimistic and and have the pressure? I mean, you're you're a mini CEO. I'm a mini CEO, but to have that number of employees and revenue and profit and those pressures, you you face it and you get to hear this in those peer groups. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how, what are some of the solutions there? Yeah, I don't know that I'm seeing in the DFW area, a 73% optimism from the CEOs or business owners that I talk to. I think there's a real beat down in, in their yeah. lives. Uh, they survived COVID. They figured out how to do it. Then they figured out how to run a little bit longer with some government money. And they figured out how to get a loan for a while to get a little more time to kick. And I think by the end of the third year, they're tired. Mm -hmm. And I think in 2024, we're faced with leaders who are just exhausted. And as smart and as diligent and hardworking as they are, there's only so much you can do. And I think they've really got to a place where they really are feeling the fatigue. And so um, this is a tough spot. Most people are hunkered down in fear. Um, 
Not that they stop running the business, but they're thinking, I don't have the power and authority to do things I like to do. The bank's got weird constraints. I don't know what the future looks like. I've got all my kind of employee challenges I've always had before, but more. There's just a lot of uncertainty. So I think all the buying time things ran out. I think this year is, is really a, a time of testing. Uh, everyone's made tough decisions this year. Layoffs, not renewing mm -hmm. leases, uh, getting out of markets, some people selling their business and walking away. Some people saying, you know, I'm, I'm just done. It's It's been a hard road. Now, that's not to say that the leaders in our groups are just hunkering there crying, but they come to the group meetings going, look, I, I have hard times. I have hard decisions to make. And that's the beauty of a peer group is that no one's telling each other what to do. We're just saying, well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to do this but I don't feel like I can. And here's why. And then the group helps them see another side, helps them see, Hey, that's, that's just head trash, man. Don't, don't hold on to that. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, they, they all make their own decisions, which is one of the things a great CEO does is they make decisions. Uh, but in, in this time today, I think right now, if you were walking it alone, you could very well be defeated and give up unnecessarily early. Uh, when we only listen to our own opinion it's got so much bias in it that we don't know what really is true. But when we say it out loud to other people, they go, what? Are you really thinking like that? Then we have to go, well, maybe I don't really think like that. But when it's in here, it's real and it lies to us. We have to get it out. And when you say it to other people, they have the opportunity to go, well, that may be true, but let me tell you what also is true. And here's this, 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 and this. And it gives us hope and it gives us clarity and it gives us encouragement and energy to go kick butt a little bit longer. That's good. Yeah. So it's really like your own advisory board, if you will, yeah. right? Because a lot of times your employees, your friends, your spouse, even they may tell you what you want to hear or just nod and agree with you because it sounds like a good idea, but maybe you haven't looked at all the risks and pros and cons and, and it may be a great idea, but to have that level of, as you call it, accountability or challenge or insight must be pretty valuable. Yeah, and it, it is like having a board. And for those who have a board, they know what that's like. But however, the board can fire you. And so how much do you really want to tell the board? Well, I'm not really <laughs> sure I'm doing the right thing. Oh, really? You know, so there's things that you don't want to tell your board even. Um, and at the end of the day, none of us tell each other what to do. None of us have any um, authority over each other. And, and we're not attached to your emotions. So when you come in with an idea, we just get to see it objectively and, and we just say, well, we ask more questions, get clarity. And then we say, well, here's what I've done, not what you should do. We look at us and our story and we let that be a reflection of your, your choices. And then at the end of it, we say, what are you going to do? And then you have the opportunity to be accountable in that moment and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start a new division. I'm not going to start a new division. Whatever your decision is, you tell us. And then we then have a little peer pressure going. So that when you're making decisions, you don't want to come back to the group and say, oh, I didn't do it. I bailed because you look weak and stupid and nobody wants that. Right. So peer pressure has been going on since we were little kids. It's still there. And by you declaring, I'm not going to do this or I am going to do this. Now you've created a place where other people can say, OK, tell me, how's it going? And you create the opportunity for real accountability. Yeah, it's great. I've I've done a lot of uh, research on these peer groups and the the data and the statistics show the benefit um, to the CEO and, and the resultant uh, corporation as well, or even small business. This was a chief executive survey that came out on the top issues. And the number one thing that came up was retaining and engaging employees. 60% uh, of chief executives identified this as their top concern. And then another one from a Price Waterhouse group said that 93% said they need to make a change in attracting and retaining talent, and yet only 61% had actually done anything about that. So mm. what, what are your thoughts on that? Because it is a big issue when you're dealing with Gen Z. It's, it's a new generation. They're so transient. They have different uh, expectations. 70% of them are ready to look for a new job at the drop of a hat. Um how do you deal with that in the learning aspects? Because that was one of the things on your list, I think. Yeah. One of the things that we have to always be careful in doing is not to categorize people. 
you know, Gen Zers certainly overall have a certain trend, but I know a lot of Gen Zers who are radically focused and loyal. Yes. And I think the problem that us as leaders is we like to look at these statistics as an excuse for why we can't do something. But our book talks about nobody cares. You want an excuse? Hold on to your excuse. But at the end of the day, if the Gen Zs have a certain demeanor, journey, whatever it is, you need to adjust to embrace them. Just like we had to adjust to embrace the millennials when they were coming up. Just like my parents had to adjust to whatever I was, a baby boomer, you know? And look at us and like, you guys are lazy. We had six jobs by the time we were in elementary school. <laughs> you know, they did. They worked their butts off. They came yeah. through the war. They they wore the same shoes for two years, one pair. I mean, they have a different journey. And so uh, we we need to stop having these convenient excuses of categorizing people yeah. into things. Go, well, I guess I'm just screwed. We got a whole generation of Gen Zs who don't want to do anything. You know, figure out a way to be the kind of company who adjust to the changes in the market, the changes in the in the employee base, the changes in technology, because at the end of the day, everything changes all the time. If anything's a constant, it's the change. So great CEOs are always learning because something's always changing. And so I would say the reason that you have 91% recognize they got to do it, only 63% have done it because they don't know what to do. Mm. I mean, I don't want to have to change my culture. I don't want to have to adjust the way I run my business. I just want Gen Zs to behave the way I want them to behave. It doesn't work that way. We have to be ad adopting and uh, evolving as a company constantly, but they don't know where to start. So they just kind of kick it down the road a little bit longer and throw a little few more bucks at people, hoping that that'll keep them to stay. But we all know that people leave because of bad bosses and bad places to work. And the money is just a part of it. But the biggest part is that they don't like working there and that they can control by creating a place where people are treated with respect. Mm -hmm. People are constantly poured into and been real. I think that's a harder journey. Yeah, I, th I, I think you're right. It's it's I know I have to do it. So so the desires there, but it's now what do I do? Um, I, I read a pretty good book. It's, it's lengthy, uh, but it's it's a. Uh, more of a handbook. It's called um, um, The Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. And he talks about creating a learning organization, not just having mm -hmm. a program or a, a flavor of the day or an acronym or a spicy vision or mission. But, you know, to, to create that culture, you mentioned culture, and not every small company, most of them can aff afford a learning leader or a, a talent leader. They may have an HR person that's acting in that role or some help there. But, you know, trying to create as a CEO or as a leader, a priority list of what are the learning areas and training areas and that we need to beef up in, in um, the, the talent and to retain them. Because a lot of them, uh, whether you're talking about Gen Z or not, they're looking for meaning and fulfillment. And as a CEO, as a leader, you can't provide all that yourself. So so right. tools, any tools or processes you'd recommend uh, to go about that or some practical helps for a CEO um, to create a learning organization or even for a, a leader themselves? To embark upon I mean, that that's just kind of what you you make it as kind of your mojo right depends on how you roll as a company is the company always one that's always about learning what would you do to create a learning environment you would have people learn stuff and come share it you'd create a world where they share what they learn you'd have where we're all going to read this book and talk about it you'd have field trips you know we mm -hmm. we used to take our clients down to south carolina and georgia to see our manufacturing plant because when they would complain about stuff i'd say do you even know how this stuff is made <laughs> Come on down and see how this is made. Or even the employees. We, we had a division in, in California and we had plants in the South. So we would take the employees to the South and go, this is what it takes to make something. So when you get mad that customer service can't give you a vision of when your product's going to ship, let me show you what it takes to make this product. So there, there's, there's a journey that we go on as leaders where we just embrace bringing everyone together in a common language. A lot of times we don't want people messing in our business because we don't want them to find out that we don't have things under control. Right. We don't really know what we're doing. That whole imposter syndrome thing is really real. And so the more that people get up in my business, the more they're going to find out that I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, you don't know what you're talking about because you can't know everything. That's why you hire people. That's why there's an IT person and there's an HR person and there's an operation. For you just need to know enough to know if they're being stupid. Because if someone says, well, the widgets are broken and we can't place it on the who's Hey, dude, there's no such thing as that. 
You need to know enough about it to call someone out. But at the end of the day, you're not supposed to be the expert. You're right. supposed to be the person who leads the experts. And, and then you get great people and let them do their job. But I think you create this environment of what you want by the way you behave and the things you do. It's not this big of a quest. Just start being that person that runs that business that you want to see and then to give people a chance to step up. Yeah, mo most CEOs I've found are working in the business and not, they don't have the time to work on the business. And it's it's very tactical or they're forced into doing things, like you said, that they're not subject matter experts in. But if, if you can have the experts step forward, the most effective learning is experiential learning. And it's yeah. it's modeling and it's mentoring. And some of that may the, be the pain of documenting processes or procedures to to be able to hand it off successfully, but I, I agree with you. I think that's a that's a very important part of the the learning uh, aspect of an organization. Um, that's why people don't delegate because they don't have enough of vision of what it takes to get yeah. it done to give it to you in the first place. So they lead by correction, and they'll tell you when it's wrong, but they can't tell you what it would look like to do it right. They just know you know get out there and give it a shot. They set you up to fail. You're going to be mad because you're not going to like the results. Everyone's unhappy in the process. That's why as leaders. You can empower your people to make a decision on their own. Have them write their own process documents. Yes. Them, at least they got 60% of it done. And then someone else can look at it and make it 80% complete. And then you can finish it. But sometimes we don't even start because like, this is such a huge task. I can't write all this stuff. You're paying them money. And half of the time, they're not as busy as they could be. Everyone could be 25% more productive. Everyone. It's because we don't have good communication or visuals of where we're going or the purpose behind it. So it takes them forever to do stuff. But have them start taking on some of these roles. And if they don't do it perfect, you get at least part of the way done. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's 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 a great point. And it may not be part of your culture, but even starting with a, a delegation priority list, I was talking to one CEO. He did a survey, a communication survey, and it was how are we doing? And was surprised at the results. People were pretty candid and they gave him a long list of things to go do. And yet out of that, there wasn't a plan or a prioritized list of what you're going to go do to change that. You know, pick pick three things, have a focus group on it, have your team hold you accountable and say, I'm going to do better at communicating. Here's what I think should be in a plan. Give me some input. What do you want to see specifically? Or even delegation is start with the one or two things that might be easier, less risky, and and start to build on some of those excesses, successes. People get really bent because they give you a feedback and you don't do it. So then they figure, why would I give feedback right. anymore? But you need to give them clarity of where we're going. If I'm telling my wife, hey, we're going to go do this. We're going to cut the save. We're going to cut expenses by this much. And we're going to start working out and we're going to do this thing. Then everything we do should align with that. So if my wife comes back and says, hey, let's buy a boat. And hey, let's let's go out, let's join the cheese of the month club. Wait, what about the vision of saving money and getting in shape? How does that align? So people make suggestions based on what they know, which is usually very little. And then they feel offended that you don't act on their suggestion. So the first thing a CEO has to do before they do anything else is get a very clear and compelling vision of where we're going. And once everyone knows where we're going, then I can start making suggestions based on reality of what we're doing. And if I don't like where you're going, I should go work somewhere else. Right. Get, at least I know what we're doing. I don't want to be a part of this. Great. I'll go work here. But if I'm here and you tell me we're going this direction, I can contribute to it because I'm smart. But CEOs don't take the time to communicate with people. Therefore, they get a bunch of random stuff coming at them all the time that frustrates right. them. And you guys, are, you guys are all talking nonsense. We have no idea what you're doing. Why don't you tell us where we're going and let us get on board right. with you? Well, and and you said it right there is, is getting on board. The research shows that the, the biggest reason why visions are not successful is they're one way, they're just communicated down, and then the expectation is the followers will, will salute instead of developing a shared vision. Now, obviously, a CEO or president or small business owner has a vision for the company. But to get that buy-in, as you mentioned, is the ultimate to make it executable and successful to see the results. And so, you know, maybe having that 70% solution written in pencil and then having some small groups look at it and say, what's what's missing from this vision? And then getting to the how-to is how are we going to get there? That's where you need the followers' input. Yeah, that's where you want the buy-in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
And if you're a publicly traded company, you don't get a lot of, you're not asking the employees to help contribute to the vision of the organization. You're making a decision. Here's where we're going to go. However, the tools to do it, the method, the way we do it, all that stuff, people have really good ideas. They're very smart. They're the ones doing the work. So you Absolutely. should ask them and they'll give you the way that we're going to do it. As long as we align with our core values and as long as we're chasing the vision, we'd love to get your input if you're going this way. Yeah. So the second one you mentioned was decision making. Is is this are you seeing that CEOs and leaders struggle with that or what is the what's the solution there that leaders and CEOs can improve upon there? No, I think I just want to emphasize that to the employees, leaders make decisions. They don't always make good ones, mm -hmm. but they always make decisions. And imagine you had to make a thousand decisions a day. How many decisions, how many great decisions are you going to make? And so our team needs to understand that when the CEO makes a decision, it doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean they're perfect, but they get it done. They own it. They're going to say, we're going to go this way. What your job is to do is to support the person who's making that decision. Does she understand all the other issues out there to make that decision? Or is it just that she only knows what she knows from the board or that she's got this plan that we laid out at the beginning of the year? But if all these trends are going this way, you're not feeding back good information. They can't make better decisions. So the CEO will make decisions. They 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 do. They make a decision. It's our job to continue to give them good feedback so they're making the best decision. And and, and what I really like about this this concept of a, a peer group is some some of these decisions you should be getting feedback on from your employees, from from peers, from your customers, from your suppliers, and others. It might be a layoff or some financial decisions. Uh, profitability issues where you can't get that feed, feedback and input. So um, it seems like this concept of a peer advisory group would would be a, an opportunity to get some of that feedback. Yeah, you know, there are some topics that you don't want to run through by your team or you don't want to run it through first. And so, you know, if you're going to make a decision to lay off a bunch of people, you got to talk to HR, you got to talk to the CFO. There's There's got to be decisions that are made. But before you go to make that decision to laying people off, when you bring it to your peer group and say, here's what I'm looking at doing, here's why, they can bring things to the picture you didn't even think of before. Yeah. And a lot of times you don't know what you didn't know till you realize you didn't know it. And if you're saying, hey, I'm looking at just laying off a bunch of people and they say, wait, I thought you had a plan to do this. How are you going to be able to get your growth rates if you lay these people off? Maybe you need to be able to put them on part time over here. Maybe you need to do this. And they help see because we know the whole story. You right. know. You mentioned earlier about people holding each other accountable. No one can hold anyone accountable, but you can create a place where you want to be accountable if you really want accountability. Mm -hmm. And it's that vulnerability that allows you to have accountability. So if I'm telling the group, this is where I'm going, they can bring things to the table that I may have missed or I'm too emotionally attached to, to be open to even thinking about, oh, I can never let go. That guy's my brother. I can let go. He's been here 30 years. I can let go. That's the best sales guy in the company. If I let go, he'll take all the clients. All these fears that go through, we're not attached to your emotions. So we can objectively say that person's got to go. And we don't have any fear because we're not in your shoes, but we're mathematically looking at the pieces and without emotion saying, this is what you said you want. These are your options. It seems like you got to factor in this, this, and this, and then you make your own decision, but we're helping you get enough information to make a good one. Yeah, that's, that's great. Most, most CEOs and leaders are transformational leaders. They struggle with some of the authentic, um, participative, even servant leadership, which is a, a great growing positive trend. You may not be built that way. And so stretching yourself as a leader, learning from other leaders who are struggling with some of the same pressures, some of the same challenges, like you mentioned, who've experienced some of the things that you're having to go through as a CEO, whether it's a layoff or a, an acquisition or a, a downsizing, there's a lot of value to that. Yeah. And again, like I said, you don't know what you didn't know until you realize you didn't know it. So you and your quick decision say, I got to go do this. And then it's this ripple effect of unknown factors that you hadn't calculated on. And that's very frustrating. We spend an awful lot of time trying to clean up a decision we made in a vacuum. Um, you need to invite people into your world, people you trust. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard because your employees have the emotion. Your family has the emotion. The investors have the emotion. So there's really not a neutral 
uh, input out there other than what I've seen, at least, are these people in peer groups. And your buddies at the golf course, they maybe have a neutral opinion, but they're knuckleheads. <laughs> you know, what do they know about your business? <laughs> they're, they're drinking beer and hitting the ball around and they're like, yeah, fire that guy. Well, they don't care. That, that's not yeah. where you want to get your input. But they have fun soundbite answers, right? Yes, and they do. There's value in the humor, for sure. It's, <laughs> it lightens your load, but it may not help you with the solutions, right? Totally. So you you mentioned number three in your book, Nobody Cares, which um, um, I, I read through part of that and I haven't I haven't completed that. But you mentioned Own It was the third one. And it kind of goes along with uh, it's a, an, ancillary to uh, making decisions. But what do you mean by own it? Yeah, that's the simplest definition of accountability is you own it. And if you are always learning and getting better and better, you're still going to have to make a decision at some point. And when you make a decision, you own it. Good, bad, or indifferent, you own the decision. And, and we know that as the as the CEO, and I, I mean a real CEO, a lot of companies, a lot of people call themselves a CEO of one, and, and I don't even know why they use that word. It's confusing. But the real CEO with lots of employees and budgets and growth and these things, when they make a decision, they own it. And they don't always make the right decision, and they have to own that too. But I think if you set yourself up with good people, and, and you also create the environment that it's okay to make a mistake. Yes. One of the reasons that people don't take risk is because they think if they take a risk and they screw up, they're going to get fired. Right. So we take the safe bet. We do little tiny efforts towards things. And we keep checking back constantly. Is this okay? Should I do this? Do you want me to do this? And then they're really not empowered to be leaders. They're just being really diligent followers. A really great leader is constantly building up more leaders, creating leaders to lead. And then giving them the independence and freedom to make a mistake. You get the freedom to make a mistake. Don't you want your people to have that freedom? We just minimize the result of the bad decision by having it be a thoughtful decision, mm. by having all the pieces where we understand each other, where we know where we're going. And, and we've sought counsel along the way and we've practiced good discipline so that those the impact of those decisions are minimized if they're bad. But you got to own it. You got to make decisions, own it, and create that environment for your whole team to feel like when they make a decision, they got to own it too. That's that's great. And you mentioned something there uh, about willing to take risks. And I had a four-star general who uh, we were talking about metrics and measurements and how you measure the success uh, of an organization. What does success look like? And one of his metrics, I thought it was very interesting, was how many times you fail. And he looked at it as a positive metric. He said, if you're not failing, you're not taking enough risks That's and you're right. too comfortable. So he actually had a percent metric on his uh, scorecard and it wasn't a business's ministry scorecard or anything like that. It was uh, totally results-based and he wanted to see that you were failing. Now, if you're failing twice, not a good thing in the same area, right? But wow. you should be willing to create that environment or that culture where people are willing to tell you that they disagree with you, that they have another idea, that your idea can be improved upon, that they are are willing to, to fail and take risks. I think it's a great input. You know, it's probably a good point to talk about at this moment, uh, re responsibility versus accountability. And mm. a lot of times people get it confused. Your employees often will confuse responsibility with accountability. Responsibility is I did something. Accountability is I own it. And so uh, the customer calls up and they're mad as a hornet and they're, the sales department's not there. And so you take a note. Hey, sales department, customer's angry. Give them a call. And you put it on the desk and you're like, look, I took the note and <laughs> I did my job. And then the guy, you know, two days later, the sales guy comes back from a trip and he's like, what's with this? Yeah, that customer called. He was pissed. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> well, why, why didn't you call me? It's not my job. You know, and so they did something and they confused that with what needs to be done. What would be done right here? And and that's where we build silos of people who are doing the very least they have to do to get by. And we don't want that. We want people who think, wait, this customer's really mad. Could I help them? Right. Hey, let me take some more details. Tell me what's going on. Well, we had this delivery. It didn't show up. Well, let me go see where the delivery's at. And yeah. you just walk down the hall and go, hey, where's the delivery for the Johnson company? Oh, it's it's running late. Oh, let me call the guy back done but you know instead of that we 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 just feel like i did something i'm happy you know good job for me and so we have to create a, a team that feels like this is the whole thing we do we do all this stuff and as much as it is within you to do what can be done to help 
you own that. You jump in and you help. That's responsible versus accountable. That's that's a great uh, delineation and very important. And and you mentioned something. I was thinking back to uh, one of the things I've always promoted is a voice of the customer. And that's not just a customer survey. People are surveyed out. Um, and so I read Deloitte and PwC surveys. It's a miracle they get responses from CEOs. They don't have time to do surveys. But if yeah. you can create a voice of the customer culture, and you mentioned uh, pouring into others was the fourth thing you talked about. And so it's it's making time for one-on-ones with your customer and understanding what their real desires are. Maybe you just executed the contract, but you don't know what the real care about are. And it's your employees, you know, not just getting a pizza once once a month, but you know, understanding what what their family's doing, what their hobbies are. I created a, a one pager for each of my employees that kind of lists their their hobbies, their passions, their their care abouts, their skills, their expertise. And so I keep that on file and I go back to it. So when there's an opportunity to reward or recognize, I know that they like Chipotle. And so instead of just buying a pizza, I'm going to go buy a Chipotle card or I'm going to take them to Chipotle. Right. And so just the little details of knowing how to pronounce their last name. I mean, some little things you can start with, right? Well, and I think a lot of the CEOs these days are are uh, hesitant to do that for a couple of reasons. One of them is if I'm nice to you, you get mm. weird on me and I got to care about you. Yeah. Or I, I only care about you, but then this guy wants me to care about him too. And that guy's a nut job. <laughs> and so we we pull back and say, to, in order to avoid having to care for the weird guy, I won't care for anybody. Uh, the other part of it is we get really, really busy. We grow big. We've got thousands of employees. One of my clients is the president of Coca-Cola here in DFW. He's got thousands of employees. How's he going to know everybody? Right. But his his job is to create an environment where teams of teams get to know each other. Yes. That's why we hire people. That's why we promote managers and build an organizational style. But he builds a culture where people pour into each other. And the way he does that is every Wednesday, the entire company leaves the office and goes into the field and they meet their frontline heroes. And they go see them loading up sodas on a shelf or loading up a truck or doing stuff in different areas. And they get to know them well enough by knowing the culture of the team. Maybe they're not going to meet every single employee. They, they physically couldn't, but they're going to meet in an ongoing way enough to figure out what did the people need? Yes. And then we'll have teams of teams pour into those people and we'll do things that we'll, we'll hear things and we'll incorporate that. So you personally may not want to do that as the CEO or have the ability to do that, but you can create a world where someone is doing it and we're exactly. building that throughout the whole of the organization. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll admit my that was not one of my strengths. I'd rather, rather create a PowerPoint and work in my office. So I knew that one of my direct reports loved that. So she developed, she came up with a Habitat for Humanity project that we could work on and these little reward coins. And it was just, you know, coming out of our ears, all this reward and recognition stuff. None of it was me. It was just as a leader, inspiring and influencing, like you said, and creating that culture. Yeah. Of leaders. Let me let me challenge that a little bit, just so that we don't think that the solution is to do a habitat for humanity. Not that that's bad. Right. What I'm saying is we need to have something that goes every day. Yes. We can't do a house build every day. So the way that we create a culture where we pour into each other is that we build organizations that have team meetings on Monday every morning for 15 minutes, standing meetings that say, here's what's new this week. Everybody okay? Anybody need anything? Okay, let's have a good week. And then, you know, you do things at a cadence that's measured and created. You create some system because if all we do is the couple annual food drives, right. and Christmas party, you know, it's just not going to land. Right. I need love and reminder every day. And if we're not building some kind of environment where the team is there for one another and we build a world where people pour into each other, uh, it's just not going to be enough and people are going to leave and go somewhere else. Absolutely. You got to have that cadence and after action reports and responsibility and one-on-one -on staff meetings. And a lot of those things, when we get busy, we don't do them as leaders. And that's that's absolute key. The last one you mentioned in the last couple minutes here was results, driving results. Anything, we've talked about that quite a bit and how to do that. Any other thoughts? Yeah, that's different than doing results. They drive results. That means they make hard decisions. That means they look honestly at KPIs. It means they look at their numbers honestly, objectively. And if sales are down, we don't go, wow, sales are down again. Wow, sales are down again. No, that stops now. 
if the sales team is not going to do it, we're going to move them out to another job and let them find something else they want to do. If that means we have to go and spend money on marketing, we're going to know enough about what will move the needle to get it done, make hard decisions, make cutback where it's necessary, invest where it's necessary. But we have to drive, not do the results, but drive the results. Therefore, you need to know what creates results. So you need to have enough vision of what drives the business, what moves the thing. And that way you can make decisions and, and challenge the team to be objectively looking at numbers and saying, cash is too low, sales are down, we're making tough decisions today, we're driving the results. Leaders who wait and hope it gets better, it always gets worse, and then they've got to deal with that problem on top of the other problem. So they make tough decisions because they've got to drive results. Well, and, and having KPIs and metrics at the top level is great and necessary, and you must, either publicly or privately held. But how does each employee contribute to that, having yeah. that as part of their annual performance review or, or you know, biannual review is how are you doing against your goals, which contribute to those goals? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a big fan of quarterly reviews. I think you shouldn't have to have a year end review. You should know every, I mean, you should know all the time, but at the, every 13 weeks you go back and look at the world we're living in and going, is it working? It's not. What do we do? Cause I don't want to wait till the end of the year to find out I had a bad year. Yeah, Exactly. Well, Robert, I appreciate the time. I really also appreciate your faith-based approach to leadership. And that's another thing we can do is pray for our leaders, pray for our teams, pray for our companies. And you do that and you're very visible about that. And, and I appreciate that. And so I'll have all the information in the contact um, area where they can get a hold of you. And if they buy your book and send me a receipt, I will send them a free copy of my book, A Lasting Legacy. Wow, so nice. at no cost. So I encourage you to get this book. It's a great one. And thank you, Robert. And hopefully we can do it again sometime if you have any time. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. I'd always make time to talk with you. Thank you, sir.